This is the possible scene in Samsung's boardroom mid-2017. I won't attempt a South Korean accent. Guys, we need to start specking out the S9 for spring 2018. People already seem to love the S8 as it is, but you know, what can we add? Faster chipset? Check. Better camera? Check. Loads of plans in this department, in fact. Stereo speakers? Dolby Atmos? Check. Give the design a facelift in terms of stronger materials and dimensions? Check. Uh, OK, we're done. No, 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 no. We're, what are we going to get rid of? Get rid of? Yeah, we've got to. All the other manufacturers are doing it. They're getting rid of things. It's a sign that a phone's, you know, premium. Do we have to? We're not ditching the Bixby button, if that's what you think. That's my pet project. Uh, oh, OK. Uh, what about the 3.5 mil headphone jack? Are you out of your mind? Our users love plugging in headphones. We did loads of surveys. Besides, if HTC, Sony, Google and so want to ditch that jack, then there's even more sales. We're going to hoover up with the S9 range. Capiche? Well, they might not say capiche in South Korea, but you get the drift. The Galaxy S9 here is the phone that has everything, every feature, every specification you've ever heard of or wanted. Really, I'm struggling to think of anything that this misses out, and I like to complain a lot. The Galaxy S9, especially in this new lilac purple colour, is stunning. Perfectly formed, smooth, curved, almost identical to the older S8 and form factor, but slightly shorter, and with the fingerprint sensor on the back now centred here below the camera island. But more on the sensor later. Yes, you'll probably also still need a case, despite all this Gorilla Glass 5, which is claimed to be 20% thicker than the S8 and with an upgraded aluminium chassis. And you'll probably need insurance. This is a very expensive phone to repair. £250-£300 for a new screen here in the UK. Ouch. And there's no notch. As with the 3.5mm audio jack on the bottom, Samsung deserves credit for not following the herd in copying the latest iPhone 10 with its notch for front sensors. Here they're lined up with no need for breaking into the display at all. Mind you, the iris recognition system works just as patchily as on previous Galaxy flagships, not working very well at all with my very focals here, even after training. It's now paired with standard camera-based face unlock into something Samsung calls intelligent scan for faster results overall. However, it's not in the same league as the iPhone X's, Face ID, and in anything other than favourable lighting, it just falls apart. And it's usually far faster to just use the fingerprint sensor, for example, while pulling the phone out of your case or pocket. The Bixby button on the left still can't be reassigned, though you can now disable it, thankfully. And the buttons on the right are standard. Down the bottom is the aforementioned 3.5mm jack, fully there, fully waterproof and yet yeah, fully functional. And proof that other manufacturers are bending the truth when they say they need to zap it. Output is top notch too, with a 32-bit DAC on board working up to 384kHz to drive most consumer headphones. It's not a quad DAC, it's not up with the likes of the Axon 7 and LG V30, but it's still very good. Plus the now standard USB Type-C jack supporting Quick Charge 2 by up to 9 volts at 2 amps and with a matching charger in the box. No extra expense needed. Very nice. Or you can charge wirelessly via Qi support. Yes, that's squeezed in too amazingly. Samsung's 3D design is jaw-dropping in terms of what they've packed into the S9 and the S8 before it. There's also the bottom speaker, which is a similar component to that in the older Galaxy devices, but here tuned specially by AKG. The output pushes as much left channel audio from a stereo soundtrack as possible through the S9's earpiece, and the illusion is of two roughly equal speakers, since the ear kind of latches onto the top end. It's, quote, faux stereo, not true stereo. Still, it's a lot better than nothing, and the bass chucked out of the S9's AKG tuned bottom with its unimpeded speaker aperture here is really rather impressive. And then you spot that the physical speaker system has an extra trick up its sleeve. You can turn on Dolby Atmos here from the drop down notification controls, and this significantly boosts the top end further, giving extra if slightly artificial clarity, put it all together and I was blown away by how good the audio was in practice in terms of volume and frequency range. Here's a demo, full volume. A bit of Noel Gallagher for you. That bass is really rather tremendous out of the right side. You lose it if you block it, but... 
Really very, very good indeed. And a decent stereo image. Noel Gallagher's High Flying Birds, highly recommended. The 5.8 inch QHD Super AMOLED display, 6.2 inches of course on the S9 Plus, is stunning. Samsung is the world leader in AMOLED screens and it has been for a, a decade or so and it shows this is probably the best display I've ever used on a phone, bar none. The corners are gently rounded laterally as well as physically, which still seems a little odd from a technical UI point of view, but it does fit the curves of the device. The biggest improvement Samsung has made for 2018 is probably the S9's main camera. Yes, the S9 Plus gets a second lens for telephoto and portrait depth effects. But that's another review for another day. But the principal camera here is the most interesting with a fast 2L3, that's what it's called, sensor, meaning essentially there's an extra layer of silicon beneath the pixel electronics, comprising half a gigabyte of dedicated camera RAM. The idea is that imaging information can be grabbed far faster than before, i.e. you don't have to wait for the main phone processor and RAM to store the pixel information. The camera RAM grabs and stores all on its own, making for very fast capture when needed. Some photos captured by the S9 will actually comprise as many 12 separate exposures, a bit like the on the Pixel 2 range. Grabbed fast, processed and analysed for best results, reducing noise and increasing clarity. Further, because of that extra camera RAM, video can be up to 960 frames per second at 720p at least. Now that's starting to be equivalent to industrial slow motion cameras, and this is all in your pocket. A motion trigger system works to start the slow motion capture when movement is detected within an on-screen square in the viewfinder. In practice, you do need very good light and lots of patience, making this still rather a gimmick and not that useful in the real world. It's just for fun. Also new is a dual aperture system, f over 1.5 and f over 2.4, the former for maximum light ingress in low light and RT bokeh effects, the latter for maximum depth of field and in theory better handling of bright conditions with normal shutter speeds. Selection of aperture is automatic and roughly 50-50 across my test subjects in all light conditions, so it's well balanced. But you can override this manually if you need to in the pro mode. You can see the results here. Photos are very good and right up with my previous champions, the Huawei Mate 10 Pro, the uh, iPhone 10, the Lumia 950 XL and the Pixel 2 XL, all top notch camera phones. From bright light with aperture stop down automatically to low light with aperture increase, from macros to landscapes, the Galaxy S9 camera is excellent. I would argue that Samsung still sharpens its JPEGs way too much. It makes a a right hash of a grassy scene here, for example, but most people seem to like the extra crispness. So who am I, Mr. Photo Purist, to complain? The camera app UI is swipe-tastic in terms of mode and parameter changes, but there's a slight sting in the tail, and it's far too easy to swipe by mistake, either when dismissing the Android controls, of which more in a moment, or when adjusting the pro mode parameters, and then you'll find yourself in selfie or super slow-mo mode or similar and panicking while your subject gets away from you. In the slender camera island is an optical heart rate and blood oxygen sensor, both of which work first time and well accessed by the Samsung Health application. I'm really not sure how many real users utilise these features of the Galaxy S range, but Samsung seems keen and there's little downside in terms of space taken up. In terms of computing internals, we have an Exynos 9810 chipset with 4 gig of RAM. The larger S9 Plus gets 6 gig for no particular reason other than to have higher specs on paper. As usual, the USA cell network is different enough from the rest of the world that the Americans get the Snapdragon 845 instead. It's comparable. 64 gigabyte storage is on this review handset, though other capacities are available on the S9 Plus and in other markets around the world, but they're all plus micro SD. Here's the tray at the top, up to an extra 400 gigabytes, which can't be overstated. With more and more flagships dropping expandability, Samsung is yet again listening to what customers want and keeping maximum flexibility and maximum future-proofing. A 3000 mAh battery, that's 3500 mAh on the S9 Plus, is all that could be squeezed into this svelte frame, but it's, it's sufficient. I had no issues getting through my days of testing, provided I didn't crank the brightness up to maximum. Plus the Qi charging means that it's actually a doddle to just rest the S9 on a pad when it's not in use, for example on your office desk, because it's almost trivial to keep the phone fully charged most of the time. Now, this is a Samsung phone, and with it, by default, comes Samsung stuff. Quite a lot of it, in fact. 
from the Bixby system, which I'll come to in a moment, to the duplicate application. So you get Samsung Pay, Google Pay, Samsung Calendar, Google Calendar, Samsung Email, Google Gmail, Samsung Internet, Google Chrome, Samsung Gallery, Google Photos, Samsung Galaxy Essentials, Google Play Store. Phew. Then there are a number of Samsung services that run all the time, even if you never use them. Samsung Cloud, Samsung Health, Samsung Reminder, Samsung Notes, Samsung Themes, I could go on. These are running all the time, having been started when the phone boots, and it's a bit of a job to try and disable them. So, for a phone geek, although it's tempting to hide as much of the Samsung stuff as possible, for example, removing the icons from the home screen, hiding them in a junk folder in the app drawer and so on, you can never really get away from the fact this isn't a faster, better, more flexible Google Pixel device. It's very much a Samsung creation, and that comes with some extras and some branding that you might as well get used to. But it's very definitely not all bad. The Samsung internet browser has plenty of fans for its flexibility and ad blocking, something you won't find to the same degree in Chrome. Samsung Gallery has some great editing functions and doesn't use cellular bandwidth. Samsung Pay can be used at more terminals than Google Pay because it uses both NFC and the older MTS magnetic standard, you know, where you swipe your cards. So pick and choose from what Samsung offers, take your time to customise and prune, and you'll end up with something that's uniquely capable once your own applications are all on board too. There's Samsung's usual always on display with a choice of widgets, but typically showing time, date, battery status and selected notification icons. There seems to be little battery impact, maybe at 1% per day, which is neither here nor there. Power is conserved in various ways through Android 8's cleverness and optimising so-called weight clocks and the latest iteration of Android Doze, and through Samsung running the S9 by default at 1080p rather than the full 1440p screen resolution. In fact, I'd actually forgotten it was doing this for the first 48 hours, and when I spotted the reduction and upped the resolution, I couldn't tell the difference, admittedly with my 50-year-old eyes. Great to have the option, though. You can even run the interface at 720p if you really want to and save even more power. Samsung has come a long way since a physical home button and capacitive controls that were the, quote, wrong way round. The home button is now a pressure-sensitive area at the bottom of the display, working to wake the phone when the screen's off, and the navigation controls can be reversed to a standard order, if you like, I did. Even more intriguingly, just as with Windows 10 Mobile, the navigation controls can themselves be removed. There's a setting to pop up a little dot on the left, and this locks the bar in one of two states. In the second, which I prefer, the controls get out of the way after you've used them every time to give maximum space for application content all the time. And then you simply swipe up from the bottom, all right, as needed. Best of both worlds. Samsung can't resist copying Apple in little ways, you know. AR emojis are a direct clone of Apple's emojis, and equally irrelevant to me, and probably you. I get that these appeal to teenagers, but which teenagers can afford flagships like the S9 and iPhone X, along with repair and insurance and the rest? Still, emojis and AR emojis, they will trickle down to the lower price points, I'm sure. So what else? Bixby is Samsung's digital assistant, which sits uncomfortably outside the core Google Assistant, which is also on board here with a long press of the home control. Bixby is, in theory, for speaking things instead of doing them on the phone. So, for example, show me the photos I took on Sunday afternoon. Wait. Okay, I found 13 pictures. Okay. Rotate the fifth one by 20 degrees. Done. It's adjusted. It all works, though most operations took quite a bit longer than just doing them with touch. So why would you use voice in the first place? Maybe it's a play on the accessibility market. Bixby Vision is something different sitting inside the camera app effectively. The idea is that metrics from what you point the camera at are sent up to the Samsung Cloud and are then matched, giving you search options, usually for products based on the match. And it's terrible, I'll demonstrate. Let's point this at the Nokia 808 um, filming this. I get fruit smoothies, okay? A simple cricket ball against a plain white background and good light was matched to scented balls, bath bombs, and a number of other products, none of which, none of which was a cricket ball. Samsung, just give it a rest. You've got an incredible phone here. Don't complicate it with Bixby. Finally, there's Samsung's deck system, made more usable here with a horizontal dock and aping Windows 10 Mobile's continuum even more than it did already. It's actually more usable than the latter because it's much faster thanks to the chipsets used, but neither are really practical in the real world, and only Razer's Project Linda has got practical potential, in my opinion. 
it's absolutely fair to say that anyone with a Galaxy S8 has no need to look at this Galaxy S9 other than to gain an extra year of support in the future, a slightly better camera and the stereo speakers, faux stereo, and that won't be enough for most. But there's still a huge groundswell of Samsung fans who have gone through the classic Note 2 and S4 like me, the S6 and S7 with the various edge experiments, and this is a way to stay with the look and feel they've known and loved, to keep the micro SD expansion, to keep the 3.5mm headphone jack, sadly not a given across the board in 2018, and to get absolutely up to the minute specs. For them and for me, the S9 and the S9 Plus, of course, are a huge win. Is the Galaxy S9 the best Android phone in the world right now for the man in the street? I'd argue yes, without question. It's the smartphone that has it all. No compromises, no emissions, no wacky design, and the world is going to love it.